the test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 Susan came to Barclays Bank and talks to a bank clerk. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning. What can I do for you? Good morning. I'd like to open a bank account. What kind of account do you want? I'm not quite sure. I'll be a college student. I simply require a safe place to keep my money and easy access to it. Can you recommend an account for me? All right. Uh, do you get a grant? No, I will be supporting myself. I see. You could open an instant account. What's an instant account? Basically, it's an interest account. It has all the usual current account facilities such as a cash card and a deposit book, except a checkbook, and pays competitive interest on your account when it's in credit. There are two levels of interest for this account. If your balance is up to £500, the interest is 5.25%. If your balance is 500 or over, it attracts an even higher rate of interest, which goes up to 7.25%. You will receive a cash card for our machines, so you can withdraw money with the card from any machines or any Barclay branches when the bank is closed. Oh, I see. How can I withdraw money if I have no checkbook? Well, you have to withdraw money either using your card or visiting your branch. I see. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. How can I find out how much money I have in my account? You can ask your branch and tell them how often you would like to receive your statement, which provides you with a permanent record of income and expenditure. It will show every transaction on your account and the balance remaining at the end of each day. You can also use your cash card to check your balance. That's fine. I think I'll open an instant account. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear someone talking to a group of university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Upton University. I hope you are settling in and beginning to find your way around. I know how confusing it can be when you start life at university, and that's why we have Freshers' Week to help you find your feet. Before I go any further, I should perhaps introduce myself. 
My name is Sally Jackson, and I am the secretary of the Students' Union, which has organized this week of events for you. You will usually find me in the office on the first floor of this building when I'm not attending lectures. Anyway, down to business. Of course, there are a few things that you are obliged to get done during your first week here. But once you've opened a bank account, if you haven't got one already, senior director of studies to discuss which courses you are going to take and signed up with a doctor, there will be plenty of time left to enjoy the events we have arranged for the week. And have we got a lot lined up for you. Throughout the week from Monday to Friday, every morning starting at 10 a.m., there will be orientation and welfare events. These will include tours of the campus, which, as you have probably noticed, is the size of a small town with 9,000 residential students, as well as sessions on developing study skills. We also have tours of Upton itself arranged for you, with a bus leaving from outside this building every afternoon at 5 o'clock. There are a number of interesting things to do and see in and around Upton, so you can expect visits to the castle and museum, as well as the popular Ghost Walk. You'll need to sign up for this one, as numbers are limited. Just put your name on the list on the notice board in the entrance lobby. An important event is scheduled for Monday, that's the day after tomorrow, when we will be holding the academic fair. This is an opportunity for you to speak to students and academic staff about the courses that are on offer. The academic fair starts at 1 o'clock, by the way. There are a couple of other fairs that I think will interest you. First of all, we have the Society's Fair on Tuesday the 16th, which I think is an absolute must. You might not believe it, but the university has over 150 societies and sports clubs you can sign up for, so you are sure to find something of interest to you. That also starts at 1 o'clock, and it will be here in the Union Building. Also in this building is the Trade Fair on Wednesday from 2 until 5 in the afternoon. This one might sound a bit strange because you will find a load of banks and other businesses here trying to get your custom. You will find plenty of bargains and, best of all, a lot of the businesses give away stuff for free. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 18 to 20. We've also got a great entertainment program lined up for you, starting tonight with our welcoming party. We have a top band lined up for your entertainment, but I'm not allowed to say who they are. All I can say is that I am sure you will not be disappointed. So come along to Blackmore Hall at 9 o'clock this evening to get your university experience off to a flying start. Just one point. I'm afraid this event is limited to freshers only. Because of space restrictions, you can't bring a friend tonight. Sorry about that. There's more fun and games on Monday in the Cotswold Theater here on campus. We have booked two of the cleverest comedians in the country, Paul Frazier and Jenny Brown, for a three-hour show. Paul has assured us that he and Jenny have packed the show with new material, and as they always get rave reviews for their shows, I think we can look forward to an evening of great entertainment. That's in the Cotswold Theater on Monday evening at 7.30. Moving along a bit, on Thursday, there is an important date for your diaries. This is the official Freshers' Opening Ceremony, when the Dean welcomes you to Upton University. So remember, 
Thursday the 18th from 2.30 to 3.30 in Blackmore Hall. You certainly should go to this one, and by the way, light refreshments will be available. At the end of the week on Saturday, you have the chance to dress up in your smartest evening wear for the official Freshers Ball. Actually, although it's called a ball, it is quite a relaxed affair, so we are more than happy if you turn up wearing jeans and a t-shirt. The important thing is to relax and enjoy yourselves. Time and place are the same as for this evening's party. Blackmore Hall from 9 in the evening to 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. I think I've covered the most important and exciting events we have lined up for you, but there will be plenty of other things going on throughout the week, so remember to check the notice board in the entrance lobby regularly. Enjoy the rest of the day, and I look forward to meeting as many of you as possible this evening at the welcoming party. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a tutor and two students discussing the best ways to study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Well, how are you both settling in? Fine. Yes, no problems. So far anyway. Good. Remember that as your personal tutor, I'm here to help you if you do have any difficulties. Now, as you know, lectures start on Monday, so I thought we'd look at a few ways of making the most of them especially in terms of the notes you take. Let's begin by thinking about what you can do before you even go to the lecture. <laughs> Any ideas? Um, make sure you're up to date with all the background reading, so you know plenty about the subject already. Yes, that's essential. The lecturer will assume you have that knowledge. Anything else, Carlos? Well, uh, check what the topic's going to be. Of the lecture, that is. I'd go a bit further than that and consider what the content may be. Then you could ask yourself some questions that you want answering and listen out for the relevant information during the lecture. OK. Now that brings us to the lecture itself and the actual business of writing notes. But there is a lot to deal with there, so we'll come back to that later. What I'd like to do for the moment is continue with the process of note-taking and move on to the next stage. Any suggestions for what that might be? When the lecture is over, you mean? Yes, once you're able to sit down somewhere quiet with your notes. Uh, read them? More than that, you need to make sure they'll still make sense to you weeks, months later. Edit them? Yes, that's what's needed. Mm. It's well worth spending a few minutes on it. Any missing words, anything difficult to read, things you didn't have time to jot down, now is the time to do so, while everything's still fresh in your mind. Right. And after that, when's the best time to revise them? When do you think, Carlos? Um, I'd say just before the next lecture, in the same subject. Precisely. <laughs> That's a vital time to look at them again, for obvious reasons. But it's definitely not the only time. When should you revise them again? A month later, maybe? Uh, sooner, and much more often than that. I'd recommend you look at them again once a week. 
That's why it's so important they're complete and easy to follow. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Right. Let's go back to note-taking and begin with the basics before the lecture has even started. What should you do when you walk into the room? Get a good seat. At the front, if you can, uh, where you can hear clearly and avoid distractions. Yes, though obviously others will have had the same idea, so it's as well to get there a bit early. So, when the lecture's underway and you're busy jotting things down, what should you try to ensure? That you're getting all the main points. And what if you don't catch something, something you know must be important? Uh, I'd leave a space, then I could check it later. Perhaps by asking a question at the end and fill it in afterwards. That's an excellent way to deal with it, yes. Mm. And there's something else I'd like to mention here. Talking about going through notes afterwards, it's absolutely vital that what you write is legible for one very good reason. It saves time. You'll waste many hours during the course if your revision is held up because you can't read what you've written. Okay. What else can we do to make listening and note-taking more efficient? Well, I always listen out for signpost words. Uh, sorry, what are they? <laughs> they're the ones lecturers use to say where they're going. A bit like a signpost at a road junction, I suppose. Things like, the first reason is, however, to sum up, and so on. Yes, they can tell you when something important is coming and help you organize your notes, too. Is there anything else you can add, Carlos? Uh, there's something I think's very useful, but it's later, after the lecture is finished. Yeah, that's fine. Go on. Well, what I do is go through what I've written down, summing up the main points in a few words in the margin, on the left-hand side of the page. I try to use words that'll jog my memory, so that I can remember what everything's about when I look at them again. Yes, that can work very well. What some people do to review their notes is cover up their full notes from the lecture, maybe with a piece of paper or a card, and concentrate just on what they've put in the margin, trying to recall the details. Then they move the cover down a little and check whether they were right. Or you could put your main points on another piece of paper and clip them together. Instead of covering and uncovering, you just hold a page in each hand. Sure. It's down to personal preference, really. Everyone has their own learning style. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will now hear a speaker talking about student loans. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Thanks for turning up today and welcome to this short talk on student loans. What you'll hear from me today are a few starting points, which should guide you in the right direction for what is suited for you. I'm assuming that most of you have an account at a bank or building society that you can draw funds from. These funds will either be your own or through a loan you may have with the bank. You may even have a credit card you can use. If you don't have a bank account, I suggest you open one with one of the major banks. It's the best option as you will find major banks have more outlets. Within the city and in close proximity to the university are HSBC in City Plaza, Barclays in Ragdell Square, National Westminster in Preston Park and Halifax in Hope Street. At this stage, I just want to inform international students that not all the services available for resident students will be available to you. As international students, you need to provide documentation stating that you have funds available to see you through the duration of your study. Different banks have different policies, so search out the one that will benefit you the most. You will also need to provide a photocopy of your passport and certification of your enrolment in the university. The most common way of taking out a student loan is either through the university or through a banking institution. If you decide to go with the university, again, you need to supply a certification of enrolment and passport if you're an international student, or if you're a resident, you will only need the enrolment details. One word of warning is that you need to be clear on the interest you will be paying on your loan. The interest level through some universities is almost as much as the loan itself, so if you borrow £10,000, you might have to pay back close to 20 Also, with student loans through the university, you have a limited time to pay them back, and this time is not flexible. You might have only one year, you might have five. As I said, different universities have different policies. This university, for example, has an interest rate of 23.5%. It's quite high, but not as high as many of the other larger universities. The other option is to take out a loan through your bank. You will find that most banks will have lower interest rates than the university. They average roughly between 14.5 to 18.5%. Banks also give you an option of over how many years you want to make repayments. You can basically choose to pay it back in a year or in ten, even more if you are finding it difficult. Make sure you have an account with the bank you decide to go with. Either a current account or a savings account is enough. With either of these accounts, you can use your card to make withdrawals and deposits from automatic teller machines at any time and make payments over the internet if you choose. You can also use Maestro, one of the systems which automatically take the money from your account at a time that you have specifically stated, and deposits it into a nominated account of your choice. You might decide to have £150 taken out each month, and each month this is what will happen. Also, check what fees apply with what services. Some services are free of charge, but they are few and far between. OK, so that's all from me. If there are any questions related to what I've covered today, please raise your hand. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.